Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the museum's Walter and Leonore Annenberg Theater. I'm Jan Newharth, the Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Tonight, we partner with Time Magazine to mark the release of a special issue of the magazine titled The Opioid Diaries, which features powerful images by acclaimed photographer James Notway, who spent a year chronicling the opioid crisis in the United States. James joins us tonight to display and discuss some of those images which serve as a visual record of this national emergency. We are also happy to be joined by Senator Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire, who will talk about how her state is grappling with this epidemic. She will join us following James's presentation in a conversation moderated by Time Assistant Managing Editor, Ben Goldberger, and also featuring Deputy Director of Photography, Paul Moakley. The photographs in the opioid diaries illustrate the power of photojournalism and how it remains the ideal tool for capturing human emotion, drama, and tragedy. Walk through any of our exhibits, including the News Corporation News History Gallery, the Pulitzer Prize Photographs Gallery, and the Time Warner World News Gallery, and you will experience the power of photojournalism as journalists both here and worldwide risk personal freedoms and sometimes their lives to report the truth. In fact, one of our more gripping photographs in the World News Gallery features James himself at work capturing images in the middle of a dangerous street battle in South Africa in 1994. Three of James's photographs will also be featured in Pictures of the Year, 75 years of the world's best photography, the museum's newest exhibit, opening April 6th. The mission of the museum is to increase public understanding of the importance of a free press and the First Amendment. Since we opened this Pennsylvania Avenue location almost 10 years ago, more than seven million visitors have experienced the story of news, the role of a free press in major events in history, and how the five freedoms of the First Amendment, religion, speech, press, petition, and assembly apply to their lives. Each and every day, through our exhibits and programming, the museum informs our visitors about the valuable role journalists serve in our democracy. We convene programs like this one tonight so that people of all beliefs can come together to discuss pressing issues related to our First Amendment freedoms. And we welcome and thank our museum members and friends of the First Amendment Society whose support makes these programs possible. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kara Pollack, Deputy Editor of Time. Thank you, Jan. It is really an honor for us to be here tonight. There is an unparalleled power in the still image, and there is no greater master of the still image than the photographer, James Noctway. Last year, we asked Jim to bear witness to a pressing human crisis in his home country. He and Time's Paul Moakley spent months on the streets of Boston and San Francisco on patrol with first responders in Ohio New Mexico and West Virginia, inside jail cells in Kentucky, funerals in New Hampshire, and prayer meetings in Massachusetts. In all, they made thousands of pictures and videos and conducted more than 200 interviews. Editors Ben Goldberger and Matt Vella worked through transcripts, and Time's editor-in-chief, Edward Felsenthal, dedicated the entire issue of Time for a radical, bold idea. Jim's images are paired with voices and stories from the people on the front lines. The result is a human accounting of the toll opioids are taking on American life, the people behind the statistics. It is not enough to say that Jim's pictures are influential. They are infinitely more powerful than that. Jim Noctway's career is a visual bibliography of our age. His life's work of over three decades has captured the major events of our time, but his work consistently transcends it. He photographed in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, in Somalia and Sudan during the famines, in Rwanda after the genocide, 
in Serbia, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Iraq and Afghanistan, in Haiti after the earthquake, in Japan after the tsunami. He was at the Twin Towers as they crumbled on September 11th. Most of Jim's work has focused on international crises, but Jim grew up on the East Coast in the US, in Massachusetts, and resides in New Hampshire, two of the hardest hit states of the opioid crisis. Often, at great personal and physical risk, Jim goes where others desperately try to flee out of the belief that the only way to stop the suffering is by bearing witness to it. It is my great, great privilege and honor to present Jim Noctway, who's here tonight. Thank you, Tara. As I traveled across the country working on this story, I had the privilege to meet a lot of remarkable people. And I'd like to begin by thanking everyone who gave me their trust and believed in this project, who opened up their lives and allowed me to document some very personal moments. This presentation is dedicated to all of them and to their struggle. I'd also like to thank all the people at Time Magazine for the extraordinary level of dedication and hard work that went into publishing the Opioid Diaries. Kira, Edward, Matt, Ben, Chrissy, DW, Tara, Keith, and everyone else in a remarkable crew who worked behind the scenes to produce this special issue. I especially want to thank Paul Moakley, who did the research managed logistics, established contacts with key people in the field, and made videos. He also conducted dozens of interviews. And throughout this talk, I'll be quoting people from those conversations. It's the wish of everyone at time that this publication creates a heightened level of awareness within our population at large and also among decision makers that the national dialogue about this crisis will be advanced and the more effective ways of dealing with it will be initiated. The motivation to work on a story about the opioid epidemic goes back to what motivated me to become a photographer in the first place. The Vietnam War began when I was in high school and it lasted until I was well out of college. Images of the war were at odds with the rhetoric of our political and military leaders. They showed us what was really happening on the ground and helped galvanize public protest. By the time the war was over, many long years after it had begun, millions of Vietnamese had been killed and over 58,000 American lives had been lost. It was a staggering figure. Inspired by the powerful social impact of the photographs from Vietnam, when I decided to become a photographer, it was to be a war photographer. 35 years later, I've been involved in photographing many wars and conflicts, as well as critical social issues and global health problems, almost exclusively in foreign countries. In 2016, over 64,000 Americans died from drug overdoses, more than died in all of Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan combined. 64,000 deaths in a single year, not from wars or natural disasters or plagues caused by lethal microbes, but, but by people killing themselves by using narcotics. It's hard to believe. As I learned photographing wars, statistics are an abstraction. To even begin to understand the reality of a situation, it's necessary to see what's happening to individual people one by one. As a photographer, I knew it was time to revisit my own country. What I discovered is an American nightmare. Paul had identified Dayton, Ohio as one of the worst hit cities in the country, and we began our journey there. Deputies from the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office are among the first responders on overdose calls. 
we quickly learned how the use of Narcan, a drug that temporarily counteracts the effects of heroin, saves lives time after time. This is Tasha, mother of two children and a grandmother who OD'd on the front porch of her home and was revived by Narcan. She'd been in jail and in rehab, and last November 9th, she died from an overdose of fentanyl and heroin. She was 38 years old. Chad Call overdosed for the fourth time this past 4th of July. He'd been injured playing football in high school and at the age of 17 became addicted to prescription painkillers. By the time he was 25, his insurance ran out and he turned to heroin, which was cheaper and easier to get. He lost his job, his apartment, his relationship with the mother of his daughter, and he went to jail for robbing two gas stations. I talked with him a couple of weeks after I made this photograph, and I found him to be very aware and articulate about what had happened to him. I asked him why he continued to take a substance that he knew could be fatal every time he used it. I asked him if it was because he had given up on life, and he told me he had not given up, that life and the people he was close to meant a lot to him. But in his own words, heroin grabs a hold of you and it won't let go. You have to have it. You don't just hurt yourself, you're hurting everybody else around you that cares about you, that loves you. This selfishness of addiction takes over. It turned me into somebody I never thought I would be. Roger McLaren, age 61, is so lost to addiction, he's been known to overdose several times in a single day. As Montgomery County Sheriff Phil Palmer explained, the epidemic has changed our job drastically. We've become more of a service provider. We're doing Narcan to save them, then we drive them to the treatment center. We become more compassionate. This man overdosed on a drug known as Flaca, which contains heroin and causes delirium and wild physical spasms. He was so out of control, the deputies were at a loss about what to do. They could only watch over him while they waited for the ambulance crew to arrive. At a trailer park out in the countryside, Deputy Jim Geiswhite saved a man with a dose of Narcan. Sheriff Plummer describes the demands that are being put on emergency medical teams. There's times when every medic in the city is tied up on an overdose. Then we have to call in, call in mutual aid from other cities. So we're tied up on overdoses and your grandmother has a heart attack and she has to wait five more minutes because another city medic to come and save her. Every overdose has an impact on many other people. The man's partner was left stunned and afraid. A man was found dead on the 4th of July from an overdose of carfentanil and crack cocaine. Sergeant David Statzer described his reaction. You can only see so much. That particular day, I hate to say it, but it's another call. It's just another overdose. It's not that I don't care. It's not that at all. It's just become mind numbing. Emergency medical personnel worked for a long time trying to revive Christopher Short from a fentanyl overdose, but he didn't make it. Tina Short told us about her son. He was getting his life in order. He had plans. He was looking toward the future. I just don't understand. I don't know if he was just tired of fighting it. It's a horrible, horrible thing for parents to go through. According to Sheriff Plummer, fentanyl is a synthetic substance made in super labs in China and Mexico. It's so much more addicting than heroin. It's easier to produce. Our addicts don't want heroin. They're now wanting fentanyl and car fentanyl, which is very, very powerful and addicting. And the problem is, it's killing people. 
Shyla Jones waited in her kitchen as first responders tried to save her boyfriend who had overdosed in the next room. Dr. Kent Harshbarger, the chief coroner from Dayton, described the epidemic as a mass medical fatality event, analogous to a plane crash or a large terrorist attack, only in slow motion. The epidemic poses a huge challenge for law enforcement. This woman was taken into custody by Detective Keith Saunders for possession of 27 fentanyl capsules. But arresting individual users or small-scale sellers doesn't make a dent in the overall influx of drugs. Sheriff Plummer describes the dynamics of the problem in Dayton. We have Route 70 and 75, the crossroads of America. So the heroin is coming directly from Mexico to Dayton nonstop. Then they can hit Interstate 70, which runs east-west, so it can go to Chicago, it can go to New York. We're now what you call a source city. This is where people come to get it. A photograph of an arrest for heroin possession. Extensive work by undercover deputies in a sting operation resulted in the arrest of a local distributor. But Sheriff Plummer describes the frustration involved, even in a big arrest. We've had tremendous drug busts here, and we haven't affected the price one dollar. We haven't affected the supply at all. Overdoses go down for a few days, then it will spike back up because more product come in. Undercover police in Huntington, West Virginia also worked a sting operation and a SWAT team staged a successful raid against a drug distributor. Several suspects were taken into custody. In Tierra Amarilla, New Mexico, a great majority of the inmates in the county detention center are in for drug offenses, including Adrian Redwine, who's a former guard in that same jail. But as Jan Rader, fire chief of Huntington, West Virginia, points out, locking them up isn't the answer. People who go to jail with no services for their problem, 93% of them recidivize. Holly Atkins was an inmate in the county jail in Dayton, going through detox the hard way. She's an accountant with her own office, the mother of five children and a grandmother. In describing the pain of detox, she said, it's like glass in your bones. Sheriff Plummer explained the current situation in lockup. We have a cell full of 30 inmates shaking and shivering under their covers because they're withdrawing and detoxing in jail. It's sad that we treat people that way. We're treating this wrong as a community, as a country. We're better than this. An alternative to incarceration has been developed in Huntington, West Virginia. It's called drug court. In the words of Jan Rader, it's a treatment court where there's intensive supervision group and individualized therapy where they're helped, given social services, to deal with all the issues they have, there's less than a 10% recidivism rate. Greg Howard, the chief judge, described what was happening to Seth Dial during a hearing. He relapsed and didn't tell anybody and got caught by a drug screen. That's a dishonest relapse, and that's why we put him in jail. I think I gave him 48 or 72, 72 hours to get his head on right. We've already made the conscious decision that these are people we want to rehabilitate, not just punish. They're people we're trying to get back into the community to be productive citizens. Another promising rehabilitation program has been developed at the Kenton County Detention Center in Covington, Kentucky by Jason Merrick, a former heroin addict who went on to earn a bachelor's then a master's degree. He describes his own recovery process this way. I spent many years in active addiction before I was able to accept and find help. I had to come to terms with the shame and guilt surrounding the wreckage of my past. 
the lives I had impacted, the wasted time. That was a struggle until I began to really understand that there was a way to take that and mold it into a tool that could be used to help other people. I'm one of the lucky ones. I was able to make it out alive. I thought it was time to see the epidemic from the point of view of drug users themselves. We began in the south end of Boston where we met John, who was homeless, but who once had a successful career as a salesman, making upwards of $100,000 a year. He was intelligent, articulate, sociable, a very likable person who committed petty crimes to support his addiction. He'd been in jail and had recently gone through a rehab program, but when he tried to go to the next step in recovery and find a place in a halfway house, there was no room. He ended up staying in a shelter where conditions were so miserable, he resumed using drugs. He was injecting heroin in the bathroom of the restaurant on the second day of his relapse. Heroin addiction is so powerful that if only dirty needles are available, then that's what people will use. Harm reduction organizations such as AHOPE collect used needles and distribute clean ones to prevent outbreaks of AIDS and hepatitis. This is a man named Dave on a bitter cold night directly across the street from a homeless shelter. He had to use drugs in a furtive manner but in communicating with me, he was open, direct, and unapologetic about who he is. He was glad we were working on a story about heroin addiction, and he wanted to be part of it. Our guide and mentor in Boston was Sarah Mackin, Director of Harm Reduction Services for the Boston Public Health Commission and the head of AHOPE. She earned a master's degree in public health and has more than a decade of experience in her field. The outreach program she founded currently serves over 7,000 people. Her willingness to take us under her wing and show us her world really helped establish trust with the people she's working with. For Sarah, harm reduction is more than a humane and practical strategy. It's a philosophy. In her words, how do we take drug use out of the shadows and into the light and start treating it like the chronic illness that it is? You can't deny someone life-saving interventions because they won't stop using drugs. When someone comes back with a positive tox scan, it shouldn't be an opportunity to eject them from the healthcare system. That's when people die. If someone's injecting and using a clean needle, that's a positive change. They're not hanging their head in shame. They're coming back and they're asking for help. Harm reduction embraces recovery. <clears throat> Even though harm reduction is sanctioned by the city, at the shelter, needles are confiscated. The staff has a reputation for being disrespectful and many homeless people would rather fend for themselves, even in the cold, than stay in the shelter. We wanted to see how the epidemic is affecting the western part of the country, so we traveled to San Francisco and New Mexico. The streets of the Tenderloin and South Market districts were filled with homeless people. The number of drug users shooting up in plain sight right on the sidewalk came as a surprise. In Boston, people use drugs with at least a pretense of trying to hide it. In San Francisco, it was right out in the open. When the project began, I thought trying to photograph people using drugs would cause suspicion and hostility. But as I'd experienced in Boston, if I approached people with respect, took the time to introduce myself and explain the project, when I asked permission to photograph, people were open and respectful in return. Almost everyone wanted to participate. By and large, I was impressed by their intelligence and their ability to articulate what was happening to them. Instead of hiding from the camera, people thanked me for doing the story. I met Pangea, who was bright, charming, charismatic, and deeply troubled. 
She spoke candidly about what she was going through. I'm getting older. I see less and less of the future I want for myself and more and more of this taking over. People that don't ever experience a thing think you could just quit. You can't just quit. I was born a drug addict. This happened to me in the womb. The deeper I got into this story, the relationship between drug users and their children, both born and as yet unborn, emerged as a tragic subtext. In the midst of getting high, this young woman began to tell me about her children, how they'd been taken away from her, and how much she wanted to try to get them back. Mary Howe, the founder and executive director of Homeless Youth Alliance, became our guide. She's a former drug user and homeless runaway who for the past 19 years has dedicated herself to addressing the needs of young street people. She explained how her organization operates and the philosophy behind it. It's very much about meeting people in the moment, accepting them in that moment, and building relationships. If someone wants an individual appointment with a therapist or a psychiatrist, we can schedule that right there on the street. In the evenings, we do the syringe access program. We have a doctor who provides medical care. We now have a Suboxone clinic, methadone referrals, HIV testing. It's, it's not just about the needles. It's about the connection. This is Bobby Lee helping a friend get high. He's a fully functioning addict who holds down a job and lives in a camper that he parks on the streets. Mary Howe continued, it's about giving people a place to feel accepted as they are. I enable people to take care of themselves, to reduce harm in their own lives, to reduce harm in the community, to have a life of value, to have esteem as a person. We fear what we don't know. If we take the stigma and the bias out of something early on, the story goes very differently. Now every community can say, it's me, it's in my community. From San Francisco, I traveled to Rio Arriba County in northern New Mexico, which has the highest overdose rate in the state and more than five times the national average. Sheriff's Deputy Dorothy Anacute responded to an overdose call outside the village of El Calde. The sheriff's office in Rio Arriba has been hard hit by the epidemic. A captain's daughter, a sergeant's stepson, and the sister of a deputy all died from drug overdoses. The ways in which opioids have affected children and the ways in which children have affected members of their families is at the heart of this crisis. Because heroin addiction is both insidious and unnatural, it's difficult to comprehend. It demolishes people's will on a fundamental level. It can override even the most primal human instincts, the natural sense of maternal protectiveness, even self-preservation can be completely overpowered by the influence of narcotics. Rachel Hoffman from Dayton was 35 years old and six months pregnant when this picture was made. She is also the mother of three sons who she was not able to raise herself. On July 19th, she gave birth to a girl Immediately afterwards, Rachel fled the hospital, leaving her daughter behind, and returned to the street to resume her life as an addict. She was arrested for violating probation and spent 49 days in jail, where she went through detox, started working with a counselor, and is now in group therapy. Her daughter is with the foster family, but Rachel, Rachel is allowed to visit her once a week and hopes eventually to regain custody. When asked what she would like people to understand by seeing her at her worst, she says, I've been down a lot in my life, <clears throat> and I started believing that about myself. I still do in a way for what I did to my baby. I know I was better than that. I let something control me that I shouldn't let control me. But now I hear positive things, and I'm, be 
and I'm starting to believe that now. Life's a struggle, but you can overcome it if you believe and have faith. You really can. Don't lose the fire. This is Rachel three weeks ago. Kayla Roche was enduring detox as an inmate at the Kenton County Detention Center in Covington, Kentucky for the fourth time. In purely physical terms, addiction attacks people from two sides. The compulsion to keep using drugs is caused by the undeniable craving produced in the receptors of the human brain by the morphine molecule. That craving is then amplified by the fear of the prolonged, intense pain of withdrawal. Kayla tried to put it into words. My stomach hurts. My legs hurt. My blood pressure is up. I'm dehydrated. One minute you're hot, the next you're cold. Vomiting, diarrhea, cold sweats. Sometimes I feel like I could just crawl out of my skin. She talked about the background of her addiction. My mom was a crack addict, and my dad was an alcoholic. When my sister passed away in 2013, I started doing cocaine and smoking crack. And my husband was smoking it with me. When they took our kids from us, we started to do heroin. We didn't no longer care. We didn't feel anything. We were just numb to the world. Her parents' addiction had an effect on her and her addiction is having an effect on her own children. I had three beautiful kids, and they were great kids, really well-mannered. They did good in school. They had everything they wanted. We had a good family bond. I lost everything to this drug. I let it take my home, my husband, everything that I loved. It sucked everything right out of me. Thinking about her future, she understands what she's up against. I was clean for three months, got out, and the same day I got high. I want to live a good life, do right, get my own place, my kids, and be worth something. It's not going to be easy. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't have a plan right now. I'm useless, pretty much useless to myself. The 25-year-old daughter of Kathleen and John Lacos is addicted to heroin, homeless, refuses treatment, and has abandoned her five-year-old daughter. Kathleen was attending her first support group meeting in Derry, New Hampshire, for parents with children who are addicts. In her own words, you walk through every day thinking about your daughter wondering if she's safe, wondering if you're gonna get a phone call from the jail, the morgue. It's crazy living day to day like that. We're lost. We're at a loss of what to do. We were looking for support. It's nice to know you're not alone. The story of the Pacheco family of Española, New Mexico is an example of how more than anything else, people need each other and depend upon each other in order to deal with the devastation caused by the epidemic. The young man on the right, Fabian Pacheco, 17, lost his mother to an overdose in 2015. His father has been continually in and out of jail. So Beth Pacheco, his paternal grandmother, became his legal guardian and later became the foster mother for three other grandchildren. Love and guidance from his grandmother helped Fabian come to terms with his problems. There's more to life than just having parents who are on drugs. Your life doesn't stop there. I wouldn't trade my life or the communication and the relationship I have with my grandma for anything. He's developed strong opinions about drugs. I remember seeing how far my dad fell. With my friends, I've explained to them, I don't need pity. Keep your life together. Don't let drugs be a part of it. They literally kill and destroy and tear apart and loot. They aren't in any of my interests. Mrs. Pacheco insisted that the family go to church every Sunday at the lighthouse, and it has a positive influence on Fabian. You lay down your problems. You feel good about yourself. 
You don't feel judged. I have a whole congregation behind me. Mrs. Pacheco, Mrs. Pacheco is part of a grandparent support group and finds comfort, as she says, just to know that I'm not alone in this. I'm not the only one with addicted children because it can be overwhelming at times. We can't do it alone. We need the support of other people and not be afraid to ask for help. Cheryl Smidchen is consoled by her grandson at the funeral of her granddaughter, Michaela Gingras. When she was 10, Michaela shattered her arm in a trampoline accident. By age 17, after multiple surgeries, she was still in a lot of pain, but her doctor said there was nothing more they could do to help her. So she looked for ways to deal with pain on her own and eventually became a heroin addict. She had a relationship with the drug dealer who committed a double homicide and then killed her because she was a witness. Her mother, Justine Gagnon, had a career as a registered nurse and currently works for the New Hampshire state government. She has a grasp of why the dynamic of drug addiction can be difficult for people to understand. It rewires your brain to live and want and need in a different way than what a normal person in society would need. Justine talked about her daughter's death. I thought I knew what was going on with my kids and I thought I had it under control. I had nothing under control. She wanted her father's love and her mother's time and she got neither. That kills me a little bit every day. Your daughter died of an overdose. I was prepared for that hit. I wasn't prepared for her, to be, for her to be brutally murdered the way she was. Michaela was trying to get clean when she died. She said, I want to get better. I don't want to look like this anymore. She did detox and she didn't want me to know because she wanted to surprise me. Captain Billy Merrifield of Rio Arriba visited the grave of his daughter who died a year ago from a drug overdose at age 22. Many people I spoke with, especially in law enforcement, find it difficult to accept drug addiction as a disease. They try to apply rules of logic and discipline to a substance whose very nature creates a void in which people's capacities for logic and discipline are replaced by an overpowering physical craving. Through years of experience dealing with the population hard hit by drug use and by seeing what happened to his own daughter, Captain Merrifield's comprehension of addiction changed. I've always been the type to tell people, I don't feel sorry for none of you that do drugs because nobody forces you, nobody holds you to the ground. I had to learn, little by little, I learned. This is truly sick, this is a disease. Once they use it, they have to have it to survive. They get major withdrawals in jail. They come out clean, and I've seen a lot of them, a lot of them, and they go right back to it. Talking to my daughter, she says, Dad, I'm sick with it, and I don't know how to fight it. I don't know how to beat it. She says, the high that you get, all your problems kind of go away. Any pain, any suffering you may feel, it's gone. Captain Merrifield talked about his own suffering and the toll his daughter's death has had on him. When it comes to your own child, it will never get easy. Matter of fact, I think it's gotten worse. That void will always be there. Our children are supposed to bury us, not us bury them. Children die addicted, and children are born addicted. Jennifer Mosher first tried marijuana when she was 12, then moved on to acid, ecstasy, alcohol, and eventually prescription painkillers. She was addicted to opioids by the time she was 26, and when pills came, became hard to get, she turned to heroin. She's now 33. On January 10th, she gave birth to a girl named Braley. On the day before her daughter was born, she talked about her sense of guilt. 
she's going to be born addicted. It takes about 48 hours for the withdrawals to start. If medication is needed, the doctors will give her neonatal morphine to know that I'm having a baby and she's going to have to feel withdrawal because of my choices. Knowing that she's going to feel pain because of my actions is horrible. The kindness of strangers doesn't begin to describe the extraordinary generosity of Lydia and Jim O'Leary, who over the years have taken over 100 people, often addicts, into their home and invited them to become part of their family, along with their three children. Jennifer and Braley have found a refuge there. Jennifer has remained on methadone therapy and has decided to try to overcome that addiction as well. Braley has successfully gone through the period of withdrawals and is now healthy. In the midst of this crisis, I saw a lot of tragedy, broken lives, broken families, and on many level, a society that needs serious mending. Where I saw a reason to feel encouragement about the opioid crisis in particular, but in a larger sense about the resilience and vitality of our nation was, per was personified by the outstanding individuals I encountered who emerged from the grassroots from within their own communities and responded to this emergency to fight an uphill battle with compassion and clarity of purpose, with empathy, organizational skill, original thinking, selflessness, energy, leadership, and total commitment. People like Sarah Mack and Jan Rader, Jason Merrick, Phil Plummer, Mary Howe, Lydia and Jim O'Leary, to name only a few. Not nearly enough vision or support are coming from above. Light and inspiration are emanating from the ground level. Hope does not come easy. It's not something that is given to us. It's something that must be earned. And if our country can continue to produce such strong, bright-thinking people, hope will continue to exist. Thank you, Jim. That was incredibly powerful, and not just the work, but also your insight into its consequences and why it matters. Um, I'm Ben Goldberger from Time, and it's my privilege to welcome Senator Maggie Hassan from New Hampshire to the stage. Um, as governor of one of the hardest hit states in the country, you've dealt with many of the worst consequences of the epidemic, and since entering the Senate, you have remained a leading advocate for treatment, prevention, and a host of other efforts in the fight. I want to begin uh, with something that Jim got at earlier. Um, we saw through his work that this is in every way a national epidemic. It has fundamentally altered the role of first responders, of parents, of everybody who touches it, not just users themselves. How has it changed the role of governors, of senators. What has your experience been with it? Well, first of all, Ben, thank you for uh, all the work time has done. Thanks to our hosts. Um, Jim, it, it, it's hard to um, articulate any better than you just have uh, the nature of this epidemic and uh, the challenge it is posing to people at every level of our society. Um, it has certainly uh, changed the way so many of us have come to understand addiction 
or to be more precise, substance use disorder. It has changed um, the nature of the way so many responders to the epidemic have interacted with each other. Um, and it is an epidemic that uh, still requires much more action than we are marshalling. Um, I was really pleased to see Jim and hear Jim talk about um, uh, the importance of grassroots because that's really where we have seen um, the real energy and the real understanding. Um, and I think it's made governors and senators much more appreciative of the importance of interacting with everybody at all levels of this epidemic in order to eventually turn the tide of it. Um, but it's going to take a lot more than we're doing. Um, and it has started uh, because people have been brave enough to come forward and let uh, Jim and Paul and others share their experience and understand what this disease is. So let's take it from there. What should the federal government be doing that it's not? We see incredible efforts at the local level that are born of people going above and beyond. But what about here in Washington, yeah. where you are? Well, so first of all, we have to understand this as the epidemic that it is, that it takes an all hands on deck response at all levels. We have to be empowering people at the grassroots level. We have to be standing up more treatment capacity, both in terms of things like medication assisted treatment, and we have to expand the capacity that we have in this country to address behavioral health um, and as well as substance use disorder. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the writ large challenge here. Um, we have been doing some things. Um, so uh, we just, in our bipartisan budget agreement, allotted six billion additional dollars uh, to get out to the front lines, uh, whether it's medication, you know, whether it's treatment, prevention, recovery services. Uh, we've just introduced the CARA 2.0 uh, bill, which among other things will increase our medication assisted treatment capacity. It will also uh, require all providers to use prescription drug monitoring. It will increase civil and criminal penalties on drug distributors who fail uh, to do their job to prevent diversion of prescription drugs. Um, and um, it also provides for uh, measures that we can help first responders stay safe, because one of the problems for first responders is, you know, if you touch let's say a cell phone that's had a little bit of fentanyl in it, you can overdose. Um, so uh, th this is um, you know, an epidemic that requires this kind of response at every level. My concern is that we hear a lot of people talking about it, but we don't see a lot of concerted, consistent, um, evidence-based action uh, especially at the federal level. Uh, and I have been um, as um, outspoken as I know how to be about the fact that while the president drew attention to this epidemic in his campaign and has said it's an emergency, uh, we have an Office of National Drug Control Policy that is Un, you know, it has no designated leader and actually the president's budget has suggested would be uh, eliminated. Um, we have a president's commission with recommendations, many of which experts in the field and many of us who know a lot about this agree with. Uh, they, a lot of it is things that governors have been trying to do, um, but we have no funding behind it. We don't have an administration that is taking action to actually implement the very recommendations that their own commission has. So. Um, part of this is understanding it's, a, it's an illness. Part of it is overcoming the barriers that stigma provide. Uh, and that's where families and people who are in recovery have been so important uh, because they're helping us get over the stigma um, and operate around it um, and eliminate it eventually. Um, but at the end of the day, um, Washington has to learn how to respond in real time to real urgent events, and right now we are not doing a good job of it. Well, and that sort of gets to my next question. This is actually one of the very few issues that Americans of all stripes yeah. really do want action on. This cuts across party lines, it is national, and it is certainly urgent. 
but there are a lot of other things that a majority of Americans want too. We want better roads and bridges, and that hasn't happened. So why should we reasonably expect that this will be different? Our country is, is sick with this epidemic. We can't do the things we need to do to be a strong and free people. We cannot you know, grab onto the opportunity that the 21st century digital economy, economy presents to us if we can't be healthy, um, both in terms of kind of, you know, our overall spirit as a country, but also um, the harsh reality is that we can't develop the kind of workforce we need if so many people um, are struggling with addiction. Um, we didn't get here overnight. This is a complicated epidemic because of the multiple factors that caused it. Uh, we had legal prescriptions of a drug that at least at first people believed was a good thing. We had people then abusing it partly because, well, if a doctor prescribed it, we know, we know teenagers think this, well, it's in my parents' medicine chest, doctors prescribed it, it must be okay. Then we had the profit motive of some of the drug companies that produced this, um, th th these opioids, um, along with drug dealers and cartels that will exploit uh, the prescribing that doctors do for legitimate purposes. And we have a perfect storm that requires a response that is an integrated response in a unified healthcare system when our healthcare system is really fragmented. So there's a lot to do. Um, there are a lot of people persistently focusing on how we can, one step at a time, work through this. And there are people who are in recovery and leading very productive lives and really helping other people understand mm -hmm. how they can get better. And that's what makes me understand that ultimately we can beat this epidemic but we've got a lot of work to do. Absolutely, and I'm glad you mentioned a lot of the people in recovery, um, many of whom were instrumental in working with uh, Jim and Paul on the project, yeah. and they really are ambassadors. Yeah. Um, do we need someone at the federal level who is a point person? I mean, there is not at the moment a drug czar. Right. Should there be an opioid czar, and should that person be uh, a public health professional? Is that necessary? Yes, it is necessary to have a person who oversees and pushes to integrate our response, who has the kind of experience in both, I think, probably public health orientation is the most important, but public administration and the ability to work uh, with people from different disciplines like law enforcement. My first month as governor, um, my colonel of my state police called me one day and said, Governor, would you mind if I testified in favor of Medicaid expansion? Right, Medicaid expansion is part of the Affordable Care Act that expanded our Medicaid program. It provides substance use treat misuse treatment, and it is the primary way people um, often can get the treatment they need. So I'm talking, you know, I'm new governor, I'm talking to the colonel of the state police, and I said, well, colonel, of course I wouldn't mind. Um, I really wanna pass this, but why are you interested? You know, this is 2013. And he said, governor, my troopers are spending so much time dealing with behavioral health and substance use problems. And he said, we're happy to do it. We wanna keep people safe. We're here to keep people safe, but this is not what we were trained to do and we're not the best people to do it. We need somebody to coordinate all of the efforts that we need to be making at, in all different disciplines. And so yes, we need a, a single person who wakes up every day knowing that that is their purpose. What is the one thing that you wish President Trump would do to address this that he has not? Um, in addition to appointing that single person and providing resources to the Office of National drug control policy, uh, and in addition to getting somebody to be the head of the Drug Enforcement Agency, um, providing actual dollars to get out to the front lines for medication-assisted treatment, um, actual dollars to help integrate um, 
our data about prescription drug monitoring, um, actual dollars to help with the bricks and mortar we need for recovery housing, dollars invested in prevention, dollars invested in the school program. We have a great model in Laconia, New Hampshire because they're dealing with kids who are dealing with the trauma of what Jim has just showed us all. Um, it's about money at the front lines, including law enforcement, um, and it's about structuring those resources so that people have flexibility on the ground. The most important thing we need is resources. We have a lot of information about what to do. We have a lot of pilot programs that are working, and we have a lot of people in recovery who can help us understand how to do this. Um, but it takes standing up resources in an integrated way over time with consistency and purpose. And you know, we've just said we'll put $6 billion to this in the next two years in the federal budget. That is a small fraction of what is required. How much do we need? Well, I, there was a number that the, uh, the President's Commission put out that I think was uh, $100 billion over 10 years. Uh, but you know, there are various estimates. In New Hampshire, uh, our most recent report says that in one year, this epidemic cost us, our state, $2 billion economically. There is absolutely no excuse for not investing in the kind of treatment and long-term recovery services that we need. Um, the last thing I will say about the overall response, and obviously I can go on about this a lot, um, is that this is an illness, it is a chronic illness. We are not magically going to treat people, get them into recovery, and then be able to you know, pull up the bridge. We are going to need to have the kind of healthcare system um, that treats people for the rest of their lives. And the final thing I would like the president to do among the many things is not undermine our current healthcare system and not undermine Medicaid because without a strong health care system and Medicaid, we will not do this. Uh, Senator, thank you. I'm getting the sign that uh, we've yeah, run out of go. time. Yeah. I think we'll end on the applause. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. much. I, thank you. Look, um, Jim, Paul, everybody at Time, your devotion to this topic is extraordinary, it's important, and it will help save lives. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it looks like we may have a few minutes, after all, to do some questions with uh, Jim and Paul Moakley. Um, if anybody has them, we can take a few. There are microphones on the right and left if you want to come down to the front. I have a question. One second. Uh, just a moment. Let me bring them back on. Please. May I? I was struck, uh, I suppose this is for Jim, but if anybody else wants to get in on it, please do. I was struck by the almost complete lack of anybody but white addicts in the photographs. There were a few, a very few African Americans there were more African Americans in the role of first responders and caretakers, I would say. I'm struck, although I can't really prove it right now, but I'm quite sure that just about everybody in this auditorium right now is white. You all are white. And I'd love to know what explains that. What explains this whole 
issue in, in terms of race. Thank you. I wondered that myself, to be honest, but I think you've described a characteristic of this epidemic that seemed apparent to me in going around and, and uh, you know, trying to document it. That did seem to be one of the characteristics of it, and I'm not sure what the answer is. I think like there were some moments when we were in San Francisco where we did see a much more diverse community being affected by it, and I think you saw that in some of Jim's pictures. Um, and there are, I think, th there are predominantly more number, like higher numbers of, of, you know, Caucasians um, affected by this in some ways. But it's not to underestimate the impact it's had on um, on black communities. I, I would say in. in there were places we couldn't possibly go everywhere, but in the Bronx, New York, many other communities around the country were being, you know, torn apart completely by this, and, and, and we shouldn't underestimate the impact in those communities. That's a good point. I mean, we couldn't go everywhere, so yeah, there were, you know, places that we missed. Um, my question actually builds slightly off of that. Um, studies show that in, you know, if you look at the trajectory of overdose rates over the last 20 years among races, um, African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Native Americans have stayed pretty much in control, but white Americans have just increased dramatically. And I think that, I guess there's an opinion from me that there's a reason that this is now an epidemic as opposed to a war on drugs when it was affecting minority communities and people were not as concerned about who that was, who was dying. Whereas today it's everyone in this room, thank you. Um, everyone in this room knows someone that's affected by it. And I was wondering your perspective on that, if you think that a reason that there is now funding and resources going towards this is because people look more like the people in power as opposed to before when it was sort of this treatment of otherness. I mean, I, I think that you've hit on something that is sort of unquestionable, right? That there are lots of people who have rightly pointed out that one of the reasons that this has been treated with, at least initially, with the gravity that perhaps the crack epidemic was not, was because of the uh, what users looked like. Um, I do think, though, that they have to be seen as cumulative, that the opioid epidemic has also led rightly to a lot of rethinking about our approach and to sentencing guidelines, mandatory minimums, and a lot of perhaps errors in the ways that we had approached drugs in the past. So while I, I don't in any way um, disagree with that idea, I think that it has potentially also helped expose some of the other ills in our previous approaches. I'm a physician who does chronic pain management and addiction medicine in my population. I want to point out that the federal government in the 1990s made pain the fifth vital sign that encouraged the treatment with opioids of pain. The first decade of this was the decade of pain research. The point being is you can't legislate the primitive brain. You can't. The worst law that was made in this country, in my opinion, was prohibition. It took disorganized crime and made it into made it into organized crime. I think the only way we get out of this, like many other countries have done, is to make the drugs legal and give a person a chance to get them in a clean area, a clean needle, and if they want treatment, they can get the treatment and sort of, sort of like a Walmart of drug, of drug use and abuse. It would be much cheaper than trying to do everything that, that everybody's proposing here, but it's quite appropriate. You can't legislate out of this. You have to make it legal so that people can get the help they need free. Take the money out of it. Take capitalism out of it. I, I will let the Paul jump, but I will say that some of the things that um, various state legislators have done is actually attempt to mandate safe injection sites in states and overturn certain rules that prohibited exactly that sort of work. Yeah, I, I would say like one of the most powerful things we saw along the way were the work of harm reduction people who we really tried to highlight in this project. And um, you know what we saw were just people, like you see this, this young woman under a truck in the snow, and you're just seeing people like pushed to the absolute fringes of things. And with harm reduction, you're just seeing people, if, if you're just a little bit kinder, if you're just making someone feel a little bit safer, what kind of opportunities open up to help someone 
what what point are we to say when that person is going to ask for help and that's what harm reduction does and it was one of the most eye opening things that i think we saw along the way and it's just something i hope we could do a lot more on too so um i had a question i guess about uh, the releases now i assume that you obtained releases from every when every one of those pictures uh, some of those people, of course, have passed, but some of those people might actually be able to clean up their lives later and then have a concern regarding employment and the fact that the, these photographs are out there, possibly on the Internet or whatever. Can you speak to that and people's reaction to that and what you might have done to shield them from, uh, to make them more employable in the future? Um. You know, that was definitely a conversation that we had with a lot of the subjects we photographed. And in a lot of cases, we're only using for, uh, people's first names. But in, in every case that where we photographed, we, we had people's consent. We've, had, we've spent multiple days with people. We had long conversations with them about that consent. And, and, and people were very adamant about wanting to participate and, and do this. So they weren't, those were concerns that we had, too. And um, there, a, a lot of people signed releases. A lot of people, um, you know, gave us, you know, also gave us verbal consent in all the recordings that we did. Um, it, it was something that we would go and revisit people over months just to be sure with them. Okay. So we, it was something we were really cautious about. And we, I know, like, once your name's on the internet, it follows you for life. It's, so it's, it's something that we would say that to people while we were doing this. So. Okay. I'd also add that. Oh, Jim, I didn't, please go ahead. Like sneak any pictures. I was I was just really talking to people first and telling them what I was doing and, and explaining the project. Yeah. And sometimes when they gave me permission, I'd ask them again. I said, "Are you sure?" Yeah. I said, "What about later on? Are you sure this isn't going to come back to haunt you?" And you know, this this is something I actually discussed with them before I even photographed. So everybody in there gave me permission. Yeah. And I think there was also a desire on the part of many of the subjects to have their story told so that people with no real familiarity we may understand the epidemic as a concept, but to really understand what it felt like to be addicted, um, to be a user, and the spiral that you're caught up in. I think that I'm, I'm struck by the uh, photograph that Jim showed earlier of the man kneeling down, injecting in his elbow, and he was really eager to have his picture as part of this story because he felt that it was a way for people to wrap their heads around how he could have fallen into a spiral like this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. A lot of personal stories and very intimate, um, holy cow, <laughs> very intimate situations between the, both you as the photographer and the subject. Um, what are one or two stories that really stuck out to both of you? And are you able to tell a little bit about where they are now if you know anything? Do you want to go first? You just follow up on. Or w anything that really stuck out? It, w any two, one or two stories that really or, stuck yeah, out? Yeah, one or two very personal that, that you seem to have a very deep connection with. Um, and if you were able to find out anything about that person later on. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I, I would say there were, there were so many stories that, that stuck out along the way. Um, but there were, there were just like mind-blowing moments where, um, you know, after we were photographing in Boston for eight days, you know, we were there for a really long time. And um, we meet this one young man who starts, you know, he tells me that his mother um, came out the night before to, um, to come check in on him and make sure he was okay. And I believe they're actually here tonight, Christine and John Barboza. And um, I drove out to their home to go visit them to talk to them about their son. And, um, and they, Billy gave me their number and I went over the, you know, the next day. And, and one of the most extraordinary things was just like talking to a mom about stigma and what that means and how um, how we do need to come out and be open about these things, whether it's it's the need for recovery or the need to reach out for help because you're suffering from this. And um, the thing that Christine really, I mean, you know, articulated was just living with hope that her son's alive and having that opportunity one more time to get through another day. 
And, um, and I thought that was amazing, and it really just gave me a different perspective as we were going on with this. So. But there are so many. It's like, we don't have enough time. Um, I think we now might actually be out of time after the <laughs> false start earlier. Um, but uh, Jim, is there anything, any final thoughts? I, I'm getting the signal once again. Are we, are we good to wrap up? All right, well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Jim and Paul.